Continuing on with our discussion on the digestive system, so let's move on to the accessory organs. So along the length of the GI tract, we have several accessory organs that assist in digestion. So you have the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. So basically here is your liver, the gallbladder beneath and behind the liver, and then you have the pancreas here. Okay, so let's start with the pancreas. So the pancreas functions as an exocrine gland in the digestive system. We have acinar cells that produce and secrete enzymes that are released via the pancreatic duct. So the pancreatic duct is basically a, it's a vessel, uh, not similar to a blood vessel, but it's basically a passageway for the secretions of your pancreas. So the, almost all of the digestive enzymes that act in the small intestines are made in the pancreas. So you have the chymotrypsin, the trypsin, you have the pancreatic uh, lipases, pancreatic amylases, produced of course in the pancreas. So you have pancreatic juice also buffers the acidity of the chyme as it leaves the stomach because although the, the stomach is equipped with its own um, protective lining that prevents the acid from eating away at the lining of the stomach, the, the small intestine, at least for the most part of the small intestine, doesn't have that um, lining. In fact, if you look at the pH of the chyme, from the stomach and the small intestine, you will notice that the pH of the stomach is uh, around 2, 2.3, pH 2 to 2, 2.3. 2. Now, this is a very acidic pH. And then, when you look at the pH in, this, in the small intestines, it's at around 8, which is basically the opposite. Which This is uh, basic, slightly basic, because the neutral pH is 7. So, it's around 8. So this is because of the buffering uh, and alkaline, uh, well, basically the neutralization and the buffering capacity of the pancreatic juices. So the, it mixes with the chyme immediately as it enters the duodenum. So neutralizing the acidic chyme in the duodenum using sodium bicarbonate. So uh, the pancreas contains islets of longer hands which secrete the hormones, the insulin, the glucagon, and the somatostatin. So one of the more commonly or uh, rather famous or infamous hormone here is the insulin which helps in regulating the sugar levels in the blood. So these hormones together, aside from insulin, you also have the, the two others, the glucagon and somatostas, somatostatin. They are used for regulating glucose metabolism and glucose homeostasis. Glucagon especially, this is not as well known as insulin, but glucagon has the opposite effect of insulin. So, uh, insulin lowers blood sugar levels, glucagon raises blood sugar levels. So, why do we need um, increased blood, or rather a hormone for increasing blood sugar level? This is because... Um, we are, we are talking about homeostasis. We want our, our blood sugar level to be at just the right level because too low, it will deprive the, the brain of its much-needed sugar fuel. And, it will, uh, and in the end, it will, of course, it will, it will not immediately kill off the brain cell, but uh, basically, it's, you'll, you'll, you'll pass out from hunger. So anyway... Uh, the liver. Then aside from the pancreas, you also have the liver. The liver is the largest gland in the body. So gland is the organ that secretes uh, hormones, um, active compounds that has effects in either um, regula regulation or it does a specific function. So the lobules moni monitor blood collected from the small intestine and adding and subtracting materials that maintain fluid with homeostasis. Now, if you remember, when we, uh, during the um, discussion in the circulatory system, we have, uh, in the systemic circulation, we have, uh, we can subdivide it further into three. You have your, um, one of those three subdivisions is basically the portal uh, circulation, which is the circulation involving the liver and the small intestines because um, as the nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine, it's passed on to the bloodstream, the, the capillaries in the small intestine. The, the blood vessels coming from the small intestine, which are laden with the different nutrients, the sugars, and different actually chemicals that are absorbed from the small intestine, 
they pass through to the liver first before they are distributed to the rest of the body. So this is to prevent, for example, um, you just ate, um, say, uh, after this is after Christmas, you ate a lot of leche flan, so you have a lot of sugars and lipases there. So the liver, if it's not, if, if your blood from the stomach, uh, from rather, from the small intestine does not pass through the liver first, you will have an immediate spike of sugar in your systemic circulation. So your, uh, your blood sugar level will skyrocket through the roof. So this is to prevent, um, it must pass through the liver first to prevent um, spiking of any nutrient, not only the sugar, but also other ions. So the liver serve as a gateway or a gatekeeper to prevent um, imbalance in the different um, composition, the nutrients and uh, the ions in the bloodstream. So it is served by the portal system. The portal system gives individual hepatocytes access to blood coming from the small intestine. So they technically cleanse the blood before it reaches your heart. So it removes toxins and stores excess nutrients such as the iron, fat soluble vitamins such as A, D, and E. Uh, cholesterol, plasma proteins, and blood lipids are manufactured in the hepatocytes. So cholesterol, the different blood lipids and plasma proteins, they are they are aids in uh, distribution and um, basically regulation of the different uh, levels in the blood. So when you say levels, these are the blood sugar levels, these are the levels of the fat in the blood. So the liver also monitors the glucose level in the blood. When it exceeds 0.1%, hepatocytes remove and store the excess as your glycogen. It's actually is an aid also in homeostasis because, well, we do not always continuously consume food. So for example, uh, during breakfast, you ate, um, let's say, donuts for breakfast. Well, that's a lot of sugar and starch. And then... Um, you, your next meal is supposedly, uh, say, you, you ate breakfast at 8 o'clock and your lunch is at 12. So you have 4 hours interval. During the 4 hour interval, you are in the fasting stage. Now, uh, after immediately after you eat uh, the donuts, of course, the, the you absorb the nutrients, the sugars from the donut. You will have, uh, I'm using here glucose as an example, but it's not limited to glucose. There are also other nutrients that are being absorbed. But anyway... So, for example, yeah, you have the glucose that is absorbed that, Im that will immediately cause a spike in the blood sugar level of, in the blood coming from the intestine. So, what does the liver do? The liver it absorbs the excess glucose in your bloodstream and then um, it prevents the immediate uh, hyperglycemic spike. So, during immediately after eating, so the glucose immediately stores your... Um, the, the sugars in the bloodstream and then it allows the rest to enter the systemic circulation for, for distribution to the body now during the four hours of fasting before you eat again your lunch so you are not uh, your your blood sugar level is continuously being depleted of course by the different cells of your body specifically especially the brain cells now um, when uh, to prevent uh, the the sugar level from dropping below the allowable limit, so the the liver will then release the previously absorbed and stored uh, sugars to maintain an optimum blood sugar level. So basically, that's the the action of the liver. It stores excess and it gives out uh, the savings. It's basically like when uh, you. Uh, when you take your allowance or when you have if you are working you if you are working so you are um immediately after payday you do not necessarily have to um spend everything after immediately after payday so you store most of them for some of them as savings for uh rainy days and the others are savings for uh to basically you budget them for the rest of the week so just like that the liver does the similar way for the different nutrients absorbed from the small intestine. So anyway, that's for the liver. Okay, so it monitors and maintains some stasis in the blood. So this is basically just parts of the liver. Now, if you are, if you like to eat um, chicken or not only, not exactly chicken, chicken is too small, uh, say pig liver, 
if you are fond of eating liver steak and you eat uh if you notice pig liver so sometimes you will see there uh we call it the lipid ng liver so they are tough uh, long uh basically tissues in the liver when you eat those uh in the liver steak so these are not exactly needed but mostly uh the different tissues lining the uh the portals the, the different veins and ducts inside the liver okay so that is uh your liver so your liver histology the li the the liver tissues are arranged in such a way that uh, each hepatocyte has actually access to the different bloods and uh basically the uh, the bloods the blood coming from the small intestine so aside from the liver, you have the gallbladder. So the bile is formed by the liver as a byproduct of the breakdown of hemoglobin and cholesterol. So the bile is stored in the gallbladder under the, the right lobe of your liver. So what is a bile? Bile is shown in the previous um, video as uh, it helps break down the fat globules into smaller cells for easy degradation and absorption. So this bile, or the are when they are stored, they are uh, concentrated uh, bile salts. They act as emulsifiers or biological detergent. They break down larger flat go fat globules into smaller ones. So why do we need that? Because the fat is not um, soluble in the aqueous environment, and the the environment of the um, intestinal mucosa is basically mostly aqueous. So instead uh, for the fats to be absorbed by your body, so you have uh, basically bile, uh, bile acids that helps break down the large fat globules because we cannot absorb the, the large fat globules. It needs to be broken down to smaller, uh, easy to manage pieces. So the bile is the one that does that. That is why um, the different... Uh, the drugs that I how do I I cannot really say them as drugs, but they are um, supplements. Ah uh, no, they are not supplements. Actually, they are more of a drug anyway. So uh, just like um, the the one the slimming uh, the one that you intake after slimming. I forgot the name of that specific drug. Is it Splenda? But anyway, uh, those drugs. Uh, one of those drugs that are used to actually. Um, help you lose weight or against obesity they act one of those uh, modes of action of those drugs is to prevent uh, or rather to inhibit the bile so it stops the bile from breaking down the large fat globules or fat molecules in such a way that uh, it is not absorbed in the small intestine instead it is um, relegated to the waste and expelled out of the body without absorbing the different fats so that in such in that in, in doing so it you are, that actually helps you keep fit and slim because you know we your body will not absorb the fat in the food so it allows you to eat a fatty a fat rich food without actually bearing the consequences of becoming fat so that is uh, one of the most modes of actions of those uh, drugs. The only downside for those drugs is that since uh, you cannot absorb the fat in your food uh, and it is relegated to the waste, you have a problem with um, defecation because you will have a very uh, fatty uh, feces that is uh, difficult to control. So that's one of the... the um, the downsides of using that okay so anyway that's for uh, the bile salts so the bile acid the bile aids of course in um, uh, breaking down the fat globules into me cells and uh, this is this is considered mechanical digestion because uh, we are not chemically changing the fats we are just breaking down the flat fat globules into smaller manageable pieces now uh, after the small intestine where most of the uh, the rest of the digestion and absorption occurs, you also have the large intestine, which is the which overall function is to reabsorb the water that was added to the chyme to aid in digestion. So along with the water, the large intestine absorbs many dissolved minerals and some vitamins. So this is to prevent uh, dehydration as well as, of course, to, uh, you want to absorb as much uh, nutrients as you can into your food so the chyme moves through the ileocecal valve 
from the ileum of the small intestine to the cecum of the large intestine. That's why it's called ileocecal. Ilio from the ileum and cecum from the acecal from cecum in the large intestine. The cecum is a ba is a blind ended pouch that has a a vermiform appendix attached to it in the ver and the vermiform appendix contains small and may play a role in the immune system. Basically, that is your appendix. So the appendix before it is known as a vestigial organ because back then we do not know yet what its specific function is. But later studies show that it actually plays a function, and it is a multi. So it has its function is on the immune response. That is why appendicitis occurs. Inflammation of the appendix. It's because, again, this small vest so called vestigial, but it's no longer vestigial. So, uh, take that evolutionist anyway. Uh, it's not exactly vestigial organ, it has an immune function. So, it helps in um, defending the body from the pathogens, especially in the large intestine. There's a large of uh, microbacteria in the pathogen. Not necessarily bad microorganisms, but most of them are actually good. But in the case of invasion of bad microorganisms, pathogenic microorganisms, so the, the appendix plays a role in that. Now, the walls of the large intestine have hostra, which are muscular pouches that move the chyme or the feces from pouch to pouch via mass movements. So diarrhea results from the irritation of the colon. So the chyme moves through the colon too quickly for water or minerals to be absorbed. That is why during diarrhea, you have a very watery stool. So prolonged diarrhea can lead to dehydration because again, you're expelling a lot of water. So we have four divisions of the colon. You have your ascending colon because it runs upward. Uh, the, the movement here is against gravity, so it's ascending colon. And then you have your tra the traverse colon, which is basically, uh, it cuts across the top of the, abdomin the abdominal cavity underneath your stomach. And then you have the descending colon. The movement uh, is uh, with the gravity. So the, that's on the left side of the abdominal cavity and the colon turns back down. That's actually one of the reasons why, um, although this is, uh, I'm not very um, sure about its um, validity, but there is a claim that it's better to sleep on your left side than on your right side because uh, the movement of the colon is towards or rather, it's in the moment of the transverse colon because the transverse colon is basically uh, horizontal when you are upright and if you are lying down on your side, it becomes vertical. So it moves, if you're lying down on your um, left side, you are moving or it is uh, the movement of the uh, the chyme. Actually, we can, we can no longer call it a chyme. It's basically the feces now. It's a fecal matter. The movement, uh, if you're lowing on the left, left side, you are, um, it's moving with gravity. But when you're lying on your right side, the movement is against gravity in the transverse colon. And then we have the descending colon, uh, which is on the left side of the abdominal, abdominal cavity. And then you have the sigmoid colon at the lower left of the abdominal cavity. And it makes the S term. So this is the sigmoid colon. So it has the S Turn. So this portion of the colon is where feces may sit for long periods of time before moving out of the rectum. Now polyps can develop in the colon as feces rests against your mucosa. Polyps, these are basically uh, protrusions. Small, some people, uh, polyps have the tendency to develop into tumors. And they are the, they become the uh, basically colon cancer. So polyps are protrusions of um, lining. Uh, these are pouches uh, of the linings in your um, colon that has basically there are small tumors in your uh, the line in the inner rear lining of your colon. So and then finally we are now at the rectum and the anus. These are the last 20 centimeters of the colon. Uh, the chyme remains in the colon for 3 to 10 hours, during which time it becomes progressively drier and the compacted chyme is called 
the feces. So when the feces enter the upper portion of the rectum, it triggers the opening of the internal anal sphincter, which is your smooth muscles. So the feces move into the rectum and press against the external anal sphincter. So this triggers uh, the response of the defecation, but it's still a voluntary skeletal muscle action. So at this stage, uh, a star, uh, we regain the control of the movement of this of the um, digestive tract. So from the involuntary peristaltic movement of the intestines up until to the large intestine, we now have the voluntary skeletal action of your um, the, the anal sphincter. So this material moves through the large intestine in mass movements created through the peristaltic wave. Now, um, the peristaltic wave is involuntary, but the opening of the anal sphincter is voluntary so that's why we can control when we actually defecate so removal of the water leaves the undigested remains of food and fiber in the colon as well as e coli and other obligate anaerobes that naturally live in the large intestine now our large intestine is a host of um basically it's it's its own um, ecosystem in there so we have a lot of um, bacteria in there basically the good bacteria in our intestine it's in the large intestine so this um, normal flora are necessary for the breakdown of indigestible material and the produce essential vitamins like vitamin K in fact not only essential vitamins but also some essential um, amino acids in this uh, the some amino acids uh, are produced in the uh, in the colon and can be reabsorbed by our body these are who produces that. They are produced by the fermentation of the bacteria inside our colon. There's actually um, uh, a study uh, trying to understand what, who, who and what exactly lives in the colon. And they are trying to analyze or identify the different bacteria inside the colon. And it was found that depending on the culture, depending on what you eat, depending on where you came from, you have um, different types of microflora in your colon. Okay, so basically that's your um, GI tract and the different accessory organs that actually uh, acts upon the digestion, absorption of food, and expulsion of waste. Now let's, before, uh, in the topic of expulsion, before I end this part of the lecture, so the, the fiber... Because remember, uh, in our diet, we have, the, of course, the sugars, the fats, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and then we have the fiber. So the undigested fiber is good for the body because uh, it cannot be digested. So all of the actions of the stomach, all of the actions of the small intestine and the large intestine, all of them cannot break down the cellulose in our, or uh, the cellulose in the fiber-rich food. These are mostly cellulose anyway. So they cannot break them down. So what happens is that they form the bulk of the fecal matter. And why is it considered good for the body? Because um, they serve as, um, actually they help scrape down and uh, remove to get uh, when they are expelled uh, from your body. It also traps the unwanted um, materials or the unwanted, uh, nutri not, we, call it, we cannot actually call them nutrients because they are unwanted uh, the unwanted materials that we that in uh, inside our food and um, it helps us in actually removing them because it it uh, those unwanted materials goes along with them when they are when the fiber are expelled from our body so basically that's the effect of the fiber that is why um, fiber is also considered good for the heart because excessive um, glucose and fats in our diet can be absorbed by the fiber so instead of being absorbed by the small intestine they are trapped instead by the fiber in the foods and then they are expelled as waste material so those are uh, one of the main reason why we actually consume fiber okay now uh, one of the last part is about mechanical and chemical digestion. So mechanical digestion refers to the chopping, cutting, and tearing of food into small pieces and of course mainly in the mouth. So once a bolus of food is passed to the esophagus, a small amount of the mechanical digestion occurs in the stomach as it rolls and churns the food into chyme. And the chyme then removes, uh, rather moves through the pyloric sphincter to the 
duodenum, which is the small intestine. So, when large droplets of fat are emulsified into vile in the duodenum. So, during emulsification, this is considered also mechanical digestion because we are not chemically changing the fat. We are just um, cutting them to smaller um, manageable pieces. So, that is emulsification. We break fat large fat droplets into smaller ones without altering the chemical structure of the fat. And that is why some, uh, some slimming aids and slimming drugs attack the bile acids or the bile salts because they prevent the action of the bile so that the large fat droplets cannot be absorbed. So at this point, uh, the chyme is ready for enzymatic degradation and mechanical digestion is finish. So in chemical digestion, its main um, action is through the enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. They are functional proteins that work best at a set of optimal conditions of pH, temperature, substrate, and product levels. So that is why pepsin mostly acts on the, the stomach because pepsin is geared towards um, acidic environment in the Unlike the chymotrypsin and the trypsin and the other pancreatic uh, enzymes, they cannot uh, they become inactive at the acidic environment. Instead, they need to they can only operate in a more alkalinic environment. That is why the the pancreas need to um, produce large of bicarbonates to neutralize the acidic chyme. Because without uh, unless uh, if we do not. Um, neutralize the acidic chyme from the stomach, the, the different uh, pancreatic enzymes cannot act because they cannot uh, function well in a very low pH. So that is basically the thing about enzymes. Now, uh, how do we know that a certain um, uh, how do we know if it's an enzyme? If you look at the, the name of that uh, enzyme, most of them ha or rather all of them have then the suffix ACE in their names. So ACE means it's an enzyme. So lipase, amylase, well, pepsin is not, but pepsin is um, basically named before this system was implemented. That's why it does not, it's not called pepsinase. It's called pepsin. So um, all enzymes act in the small intestine except for the salivary amylase and the pepsin. Salivary amylase acts uh, in the oral cavity and, if, and by extension in the esophagus, but it does not act on the small intestine. Why? Because it becomes um, inactivated, inactivated and degraded by the acidic environment of the stomach. So you have that um, uh, chemical digestion. Now, for the saliva and the gastric juice enzymes, so these are the sources of the different enzymes. So, the enzymes, salivary amylase and lingual lipase are in the saliva. So, the substrate, they act on the starches. So, amylase act on the starches. Lipase act on the triglyceride. Lipase, so-called lipase because it comes from the word lipid, which is its substrate. And it's an ACE, it's an enzyme, so it's lipase. So, this is just, just easy to remember. Amylase... Amylase, it's called amylase because it's from the word amylose, which refers to sugar and ACE for, uh, because it's an enzyme. So, amylase acts on starches or sugars. So, gastric juices, pepsin is a different one. Pepsin acts on proteins. Now, it's so-called pepsin and not pepsinase because, um, again, it was named before the, uh, the ACE system is used. And then you have the gastric lipase. <coughs> Sorry. And then we have your pancreatic juice. Pancreatic amylase, trypsin, chymotrypsin. Again, they were named before we implemented the system of naming enzymes. So the name stuck. So trypsin and chymotrypsin. And then you have elastase, carboxypeptidase, pancreatic lipase. And of course, the nucleases. Because uh, of the four biomolecules, we have accounted for the digestion of the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the fats, but not for the, the last group, which is the nucleic acid. Now, the nucleases are responsible for breaking down nucleic acids in the food that we eat. So they, are, uh, they act on RNAs and DNAs. So, and then other enzymes, uh, the dextrinase, the, these are the brush border enzymes. These are found on the board, well, we call it brush border because uh, if you look at the image of the, um, 
the surface of your um, intestinal walls, they have the microvilli protrusions there, it's similar to like uh, the bristles of a brush. So they call it the brush border. So these are the enzymes found in the brush border. So these are specific enzymes targeting specific substrates that allows for the absorption of specific uh, nutrients in the uh, small by the small intestine. Okay, so that is for the digestive system. So I hope you learned a lot from this. So good day.